So let me start and welcome everybody who is here in person and welcome all people who are attending on Zoom. This is our special seminar before the academic year, but it belongs to the Wednesday Colloquia of the CFT. And we are having the great pleasure to host today Swayam Panda. Uh, Swayam did his PhD here uh, in CFT two years ago. Uh, 2021 under supervision of Professor Bożena Czerny. Uh, he worked on the active galaxies and spectral uh, modeling and uh, emission lines and all those uh, things. And he will tell us today about the research uh, which uh, he's doing now as a postdoc in Instituto de Astrofisica uh, Itajuba in Brazil. He's now a postdoc in Brazil, so we are very happy to have you here today, and please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for this introduction, and thank you for organizing this uh, impromptu seminar. Uh, mostly thanks to Prashana and Taihong for taking <laughs> care of the logistics and getting it done. Uh, so, uh, like Professor Yannick said, I'm postdoc right now in uh, Laboratory National de Astrophysica in Itajuba. It's a small city uh, located in the high mountains in Brazil, where five hours from Rio and Sao Paulo. Uh, very well located, so you're all invited to visit that place. Uh, quite famous for wines and ca cafe. Um, and uh, in addition to being a CNPK National Postdoctoral Fellow, I'm also a support scientist with the Gemini and Soar Observatories as part of the NOAR lab. Uh, and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, this title, which is about emission line regions in active galaxies, which are, I'm going to focus on selected studies and spectral line variability in the era of GWST and the Vera Rubin Observatory LSST. So this work is going to be a compilation of many of the uh, works that I've been carrying out uh, in collaboration with mostly Paula Mazziani from INAC, uh, Shana Cherny here, uh, and her CFP Morsa group, uh, my Eleni, uh, Francisco Pozzanunes from Hitz Heidelberg, and the Serbian uh, in contribution group uh, or the LSST. Uh, so very briefly, um, what is the of an act? And there is the matter accreted in the form of manifested in the form of an accretion disk. And then there are these cloudlets, which are bound to the gravitational potential of the black hole. The more nearby ones are known as broadline regions because they photoionize the light and basically emit lines that are much broader uh, profile. And eventually, thank you. Uh, and eventually they kind of... Uh, have larger velocities up to thousands and ten thousand kilometers per second, and hence the line is much broader, and that's why the line emitting region is called broad line region. Much further out, we, uh, if we are seeing a source from this line of sight, then we get this uh, information of all the jet uh, emission, and it kind of obscures all of the material uh, emission that is coming from the emitting regions. But uh, AGNs being more extended mediums uh, end up having variety of classification, mostly historically and phenomenologically, and eventually, uh, depending upon what line of sight we are viewing them, we could have different classifications. Um, uh, much more outwards, we have a obscuring torus. This is an old diagram where it was projected to be much more smooth distribution of the dusty material, uh, which gets, uh, which takes into account the ionizing radiation and reprocesses into further uh, infrared energy. Eventually, with the presence of the torus, one then eventually uh, could rather see the, have an unimpeded view of the central uh, continuum source or in the presence of the torus and when viewed much edge on, that could really obstruct all the viewing material that is located inside the torus material. Uh, so this is what uh, one could expect uh, AGN to be where uh, in the geometrical sense, but also AGN have multi-wavelength energy distribution, which is what's shown here in the right side of the diagram. Here I'm showing a typical broadband spectral energy distribution, SED, of an active galactic nuclei, AGN. Uh, and here we are focusing on specifically the intrinsic continuum that is coming very close from the uh, black hole. So the accretion uh, disk emission, which is a thermal emission that is most in the heat, is the UV contenized, and then the Compton emission uh, peaks in this peaks in this regime, which is called the coronal power law. It roughly represents the energy distribution from high UV up to uh, extended uh, X-ray, hard X-ray medium. 
In between these two, there is uh, sometimes the presence of a soft X-ray excess or soft uh, one coronal component, which could uh, uh, sometimes be able to help us uh, figure out the intrinsic uh, continuum shape of the ACD. But um, unfortunately, the part of the emission from the soft X-ray excess falls in this band, which is shaded here, that is impacted by our galactic uh, um, absorption. And information from this regime is sort of lost when it arrives to the telescopes uh, that are monitoring this. But uh, more recently, there are telescopes that can actually help us understand and observe the part, which is this upturn. And through uh, uh, much more detailed SED modeling, one could then figure out the entire intrinsic Asian continuum, which is now colored in orange, accounting for the position disk, the soft X-ray, and the coronal power law over here. Uh, this intrinsic emission, as I said, is then reprocessed by this material that is obstructing the uh, torus material and then gets reflected uh, and uh, gets re-emitted in uh, this infrared emission, which is a total toroidal emission. And at times, we could also expect to see the emission from the host galaxy itself. Here is an example where the elliptical galaxy of so-called uh, AGN is shown. And eventually, that gets accounted for when building this entire SED. Uh, so today in, in, in the talk, uh, my in, uh, intention is to explore and give you a also do some attrition discontinuum modeling. Right. There is a sort of a delay. So, all right. Uh, in the second part, I'm going to focus on uh, the uh, work that I'm doing in uh, Brazil right now as a postdoc. And uh, this is going to focus on the narrow, much more extended narrow line region. And we're going to talk, uh, show you some very exquisite optical near infrared spectroscopy and how we have managed to uh, figure out a new novel method to use coronal lines, which are very high excitation emission forbidden lines as black hole mass tracers. And this is going to be very useful with the upcoming data from JWST. Uh, and eventually I will conclude the talk by talking how AGNs for, uh, can be used as cosmological candles and how we have been working towards building more effective radius luminosity relations. So in briefly, if I have to summarize the talk right now, the work that I'm going to present is going to focus on the AGN spectral energy distribution the AGN variability aspect and how we determine black hole masses for these AGNs, and eventually all this put together, how AGNs can be used as standardizable candles. All right, so let's start from the first part. Uh, as I mentioned to you about the broadband uh, SED is an important aspect to understand how, what is the uh, range of energetics and physical phenomena that are happening very close to the AGN. This is a work that has started to become more and more recently more familiar and more constrained because of the availability of multi-wavelength data set and also uh, at, provided at the same epochs, so in same uh, time in epochs. So this is one of the examples uh, from a work done by Jin, uh, uh, Chichuan Jin and his collaborators, where they have managed to accompany uh, data sets from hard X-rays up, uh, extending up to 10 microns and built a very interesting and very constrained broadband SED for a very high accreting source RX uh, J0439. This is a high accreting source uh, and a Lington ratio of about uh, nine. Uh, and we can really see the, the prominence of the soft X-ray excess, as well as the hard quantization and the outer disk, which is the standard accretion disk modeling here. Done. So this really allows us to put together how the real SED emission looks like coming from the very uh, uh, vicinity of the black hole. You mean nine? Nine. The Lincoln ratio is higher than one. Than one. It's a super elliptic source. So at the time of the when they were observed in the soft X-ray, they account for this broadband SED. They are able to estimate the uh, Eddington ratio from the spectroscopy, but as well as from the building of the uh, spectral energy distribution. So this allows them to infer what is the Eddington ratio of this source at that epoch. So uh, it's true, not all the sources stay at uh, super Eddington all the time. Some of them, when we are observing them, end up having super Eddington limits, but uh, there are not too many, but we are finding more and more uh, in the more recent times. Uh, I'll talk to, uh, about it a little bit in later. So here is, this is a more recent compilation of uh, state-of-the-art broadband SEDs that has been done by Gary Furlan and his collaborators, where this is a collage of different AGNs a broadband SED. And as we can see, the AGN SED is not a constant quantity. It does change depending upon what source we are observing. So, and it's very difficult to have a monitoring done uh, uh, over a uh, few orders of magnitude in energy bands. And that's why we do not end up having a lot of exquisite SEDs here. But at least we do have a distribution here, which 
uh, is dependent on the Eddington ratio. So the SED from starting from the blue going up to this red dashed one is having an increase in Eddington ratio with B, the blue one being about 3% uh, of the Eddington and increasing up to this nine times Eddington, as I mentioned. So this indeed is a very well timed uh, uh, data set that has been provided to us so that we can infer the emitting regions and the emission from all the line emitting regions in the vicinity of the black hole using a, a distribution of SED that is now available. Another very interesting thing is how this SED is allowing us to understand the, the evolution of the accretion structure itself in the vicinity of the black hole. So here's this an example from my PhD thesis where we have uh, done a lot of work to connect these uh, evolution of the accretion disk and the emitting regions and the impact of it on the emitting regions and connect it to a very well-known uh, diagram, which is the quasar main sequence diagram. So this is a historical diagram that was constructed using principal component analysis uh, of using first uh, 85 sources from the Palomar Green Survey. And over the next uh, the la last three decades, it has now uh, extended up to tens of thousands of sources from Sloan Digital Sky Survey and all these large scale spectroscopic surveys. So what really I wanted to emphasize here is that there is there are sources which are having larger full width up maximum of the hydrogen beta, which is one of the prominent emission, broad emission lines seen in the optical spectra of an AGN. And that kind of relates somehow to a much more standard accretion disk scenario where we do not see more outflows. There's a very less outflows. These are more check dominated. And the broad line region seems to be much more uh, extended outwards uh, from the uh, center of the reference tobacco. But when we go to sources which are populating in this lower part of the panel, part of which are uh, called as the narrow line seafirts, where the broad emission line is typically much narrower than the expected broad profiles, this can be of the order of thousands to 2000 and 4000 kilometers per second, these sources tend to have high repletion rate. And eventually, we want expects and also observes uh, large winds and outflow components in these spectra of sources which belong to this category. So the idea here is that such a source should then reflect somehow and to explain those emission line, we could really have a hypothesis where we can expect a uh, uh, puffing up of the inner part of the accretion disk, which creates an aniso additional anisotropic emission, eventually leading up us to uh, connect what we see from the observations like the broadline region being shifted much inwards and uh, the emission uh, in lines like carbon core and others showing more wind dominated emission uh, in these cases uh, in contrast to the population B sources. Excuse me, sir. Yes. 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 What's on your axis? Here? Yes. On yes. So this is the quasar main sequence plot and the y axis is the, the, the velocity dispersion. It's the indication of velocity dispersion of the edge beta line. I have a plot actually here. Yes. So uh, this profile here in the middle, it happens at 4861. It's an already in rest frame wavelength. So this is the edge beta line. So one does a spectral fitting and tries to fit the broad component of this, which relates to the emission coming from the broad line region. And on the x-axis, it's a parameter RFE2, which is basically the strength of the FE2 emission here, which is highlighted here in the blue, blue side of the edge beta normalized to the uh, uh, flux from the HP. So this is a ratio of how much iron content one has with respect to hydrogen. So in a sense, it's a metallicity indicator as well. Uh, so uh, moving forward, so the idea of really puffing up the disk uh, can be uh, in a cartoon sense illustrative uh, here, which is uh, basically uh, inspiration taken from earlier works uh, uh, by Abramovich et al. and Jan Ming Wong and uh, Alex Sadowski's thesis where one can see that one, when one includes a structural change in the accretion disk where the disk emission, this structure moves from a standard accretion disk to a slim accretion disk scenario, one then expects and sees a change of accretion rate evolving as a function of the height. So by increasing the accretion rate where this is depicted as M dot, uh, this M dot is, uh, um, is synonymous to the accretion rate, but it's a dimensionless quantity. Uh, which is dependent on the luminosity of the source and the black hole mass of the source, and also has information of the inclination towards the source. Eventually, all together, this becomes a quantity which uh, here in this plot by Yang Ming Wang's paper, 
one can see one starts from a very sub Eddington ratio uh, limit, which is here in the red, where the disk is very flat in the vertical direction. It doesn't really extend a lot. But one, when one goes increasing the accretion rate towards here in the orange is 1000, very much at the limit of Eddington ratio. One then sees that the height changes proportionally to the length, uh, to the radial direction. And this is what really happens and is uh, in a cartoon sense shown here. With the increase of the higher M, M dot, one then starts to expect the sort of uh, inflation or uh, sort of uh, puffing up of the inner part of the accretion disk. And what that again does, it creates this dichotomy in the emitting regions. So we had the broadline regions located somewhere here. And in the previous picture, when the disk was flat, it really didn't matter except the cosine of the angle where the emission was coming from. So it was very much symmetric in that sense. But once with the appearance of this puffy part of the accretion disk, it creates a dichotomy of stronger radiation felt by clouds, which are hovering very close to the line of axis here, uh, the spin axis. And in, in contrast, those clouds, which are the, uh, much more closer to the accretion disk uh, mid plane, they receive much filtered emission. And that really helps us to identify how the line emission structure is variant as a function of accretion rate, which is then given as a function of the spectral energy distribution. So what we ended up doing is that we assimilated the sim accretion disk spectral energy distribution and combined it together with the X-ray corona. Uh, and then we fitted them with the observed SEDs from Kerland et al. that I showed you a few slides before. Uh, mostly we are concentrating on the higher pleaters where the structural change is much more emphasized. And this is an example where I'm showing when an observer is looking at very uh, much into the face on, really looking at the black hole from the top and how the SED evolves as a function of the accretion rate, dimensionless accretion rate. So the red component here is the slim disk accretion disk, and the green one is the coronal power law and the X-rays. And these are all combined together. So we prepared a database as a function of accretion rate, as well as a function of the inclination angle. So here we are showing a case where it's 40 degrees. So eventually we are seeing pretty much at the line axis where it demarcates the two regions, the region one being much more hotter and region two is seeing much more filtered emission and eventually going towards much more edge on inclinations like the 70 degree case here. And we can clearly see how the SEDs have evolved when going from the uh, top uh, edge, uh, face on appear orientation towards edge on orientation as a function of changing accretion rate. So eventually this the next plan of the work is that we try to identify what part of the ionizing flux is eventually useful in order to create those emission lines that we are familiar of and all that that we saw in the quasar mean sequence diagram. And uh, the idea here is that we have this limit uh, threshold at one Rydberg, 13.6 electron volt. And eventually we are accounting for all the energy that is at and above one Rydberg. So this is our uh, base condition at accretion uh, dimension as accretion rate 100 and inclination angle 10. And over here on the right is the matrix plot showing the ratio of uh, the energy, photon energy uh, based on this area uh, as a function uh, with respect to this case. So the first case, of course, is at 1, at 10 degree and uh, m dot 100. And what we see are two very interesting things. The amount of ionizing photon flux available it decreases with increasing viewing angle, as we saw because of the appearance of this much more puffed up part. And the other thing is the trend with respect to the M dot, it starts to increase first. So here's the, in these cases, the highest one is achieved at M dot 500 and inclination 10, but it drastically reduces when we are at the highest ending condition. And this trend is not, not that monotonic as we expect with respect to the viewing angle, when this is quite monotonic, it keeps decreasing as we go on towards more edge on angles. So the obvious extension of this is that to prepare this global picture of agent emission at higher accretion rate, uh, the models have been prepared, the paper is uh, in preparation, we are going to submit it very soon. And we are going to look not only at the specific line edge beta, but we are going to try to identify all the UV up to uh, near infrared emission lines and how their impact uh, is based on the changes of the SED itself. So these are results that we want to counter and confront against the reverberation results, something that I'm going to talk to you in a few minutes. 
and see how this sort of uh, change in the equation the structure leads to the change in the emission line uh, picture that we kind of are more and more aware in the observational sense. I have one question at this moment. Do you count the energy above one Rydberg or do you count the number of ionizing photons? Number of ionizing photons. It's the area it's under the, the curve. Same. It's not the same, yes. It's it's the area under this curve that has been accounted. This, this is what goes as an input to the cloudy radiative transfer simulations, indeed. Yeah, it's the uh, uh, the energy normalized to HNU, so this way it's the number. Hmm. So, like I said, why why are we interested in this uh, high Eddington ratio sources, and why exactly it is interesting to see these kind of sources? And this was motivated by the observational results that came up very recently, where this is a picture which is showing the radius of the BLR. So it's basically how far the broadline regions are from the accretion disk, the central ionizing source, and the characteristics monochromatic luminosity at a certain wavelength. This is at 5,100 angstrom. So this is a proxy of the AGN luminosity coming from the accretion disk. Eventually, what when we populate multiple sources and observing over long, uh, long period of time, over decades some, for some sources, and we start populating the diagram with this, uh, these sources, one notices that there are some sources that deviate from the standard relation, which is shown here in the dashed line. And interestingly, these are the sources which are narrow line sequence sources, tend to have higher accretion rate and show shorter sizes of the VLR. So they are much closer somehow uh, to the central ionizing source. So one study that we try to uh, uh, Accompany in, in the last work uh, in 2021 uh, during my PhD was we accounted for this kind of shift uh, by assuming a certain obscurer in, in, in front of the uh, um, VLR and trying to identify whether that could identify whether these uh, structural change in the VLR and be shifting to a smaller radius can be accounted for and whether the emission that we are seeing from modeling can be uh, compared against the observed uh, line ratios and emissions that we see for these source. Indeed, what we found is that depending upon the viewing angle and whether where is the VLR located and with respect to the VLR where the distant observer is located, probably they are seeing a different set of SEDs. So the SED seen by the VLR, or the energy distribution seen by the VLR is quite different from the energy distribution that a distant observer sees eventually. And we tried doing some sort of modeling, but the recent result that I showed you here are in the line of uh, direction where we are trying to accompany a much more convincing and constrained model and not really cherry picking uh, certain inclinations or uh, certain accretion rates. So here, eventually, the idea is that we would like to uh, address this issue that high accretors indeed deviate from classical relation based on the structural changes of the accretion disk which then impacts the emission coming from the emitting regions near to the black hole. So we'll come back to this soon in uh, more details. So uh, I pretty much ex uh, explained the radius luminosity diagram, but just briefly how this radius luminosity diagram came into play is that uh, there is this interesting technique called the reverberation mapping, where the idea is that the, the accretion disk around the supermassive black hole emits uh, sort of semi-isotropically uh, in all the direction, but there are some line of sights where the energy, the photons can directly come to the observer. But because of the presence of these clouds, such as much more nearby clouds like drop line vision clouds, part of the photon can get intercepted by the VLR clouds, and then some of them can get scattered in our line of sight. So eventually, this extra time taken by the photon uh, gets Im uh, imprinted in the light curve that we try to obtain for these sources. So depending upon what filters and wavelength we are seeing, we can either get the idea of direct continuum from the central source, or depending upon what other wavelengths we are seeing, we get much more information of the scattered continuum uh, that is first impacted by the VLR. So here's an example of a very well-known source, Markadian 335. On top is the continuum light curve. It's uh, in uh, very close to the 5,100 angstrom. And on bottom is the case of uh, the emission light, the light curve of the emission light HP tau. So here we can clearly see when one tries to do a cross correlation across the light curve, one can see a displacement of a very fixed value. And this fixed value basically, when translated into distances, allows us to determine the size of the H beta or size of the BLR. And this is how we populate this diagram of the radius luminosity. So we get the luminosity either from photometry or spectroscopy, 
and the sizes are determined using this reverberation technique, also spectroscopy and photometry together. So this is uh, one of more recent. This has been updated more recently. Now, uh, overall, in literature, we have over 200 reverberation mapping mapped AGNs with edge beta emitting line uh, sizes. Uh, the method is not limited to just edge beta. The method has been extended towards other emission lines like magnesium-2, carbon-4, Lyman-alpha. So uh, there is a lot of material already available to study uh, and uh, dissect the emitting region of the broadline uh, clouds. Uh, in terms of this various line emissions that we see. So, yeah. yes. Okay, yes. That uh, statement that reverberation mapping lies on the fact and light emitting uh, mm -hmm. I think it should be the light emitting. Ah, so what I mean by the light emitted, because we have a line photon, there are two concepts, right? We have the continuum photon and the line photon. So the continuum photon, when it gets photoionized by the VLR, it produces a line photon. So it's still an uh, emission in that process, but okay, I, I understand your yeah, the point that you mentioned. With the yes, but it's indeed the light that we are seeing. So, but it's the reprocessed light as a line photon. So, yes, it is an uh, emission, but it's a line emission and not a continuum emission there. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so at least uh, you are looking at light emitted by the VLR is reprocessed from central consumption source. That is Okay, sorry, sorry for that confusion. So yeah, what? Right. So it's I right. think what I think you got the idea that it's basically okay. the line, uh, the continuum photons from the equation disk, they sort of get intercepted by the VLR. They photoionize the line uh, photons, and then it produces a line photon. And that's in this case where, when there's a scattered emission, you see also the line emission. So I just made maybe said emitted a light emitted, but it's the line line emitted. Yes, yes, yes. Probably it should have been line, but okay, yes. It looks like Polish structure of the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> see. That, that should be a good thing for me. <laughs> um, so fast forward to uh, uh, the current epoch right now, we are in very well placed and uh, this is an upcoming telescope that is going to start monitoring very soon. We are not very sure, uh, probably next year. Uh, this is the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, and the goal of this Vera C. Rubin Observatory project is to conduct a 10-year legacy survey of space and time, in short, LSST. So eventually, LSST is going to deliver a 500 petabyte set of images and data products and create a decade-long movie of our own universe. And this is also going to account uh, and allow us to discover tens and millions of AGNs extending up to very high redshifts, up to redshift 7 and higher. And the base of this telescope is an 8.4 meter Simoni survey telescope. It uses a special three mirror design. This is the mirror. This is the state of the art 3.2 gigapixel camera that is going to be installed on the way to be installed uh, at the observatory in Chile. And the idea of this telescope is going to survey the entire night sky, 18,000 square degrees of the night sky in only three nights. So let me play this back again. So, so okay, I think. I had a GIF here, but uh, the whole idea was that uh, the intention from our group, basically I started this during my PhD uh, with Professor Cherney, is that we would like to do photometric reverberation mapping with the LSST. And here's this is a clean example of how a spectra looks like and where are those filters, the broadband filters. So this is an imaging telescope. So these are the broadband uh, filters that it is going to carry out uh, the observations with. And depending upon what redshift we are, we would be able to identify filters which contain the emission line and another filter, complementary filter, which would contain just the information of the continuum. So eventually we should be able to find two light curves, do the cross correlation and find the sizes of the VLR for that supposed line. And since we are going to expand up to redshifts up to seven, we will be carrying out information for multiple emission lines. And that's how we will also be getting multiple continuum windows and perform this reverberation technique over all these broad and prominent emission lines. So this is something that we tried to do more recently. And uh, the, uh, the LSST's idea is not just to wait until the real data comes. We cr created also a lot of simulations that allows us to span the entire night sky to test and check whether the survey techniques are going to be optimal for our science cases. So this is one such example where we collected the simulated data of the entire night sky provided by the LSST data management group uh, for a part of the night sky. So here, this is a particular field, the Elias S1, very well studied in multi-wavelet sense. 
And these are the light curves over the 10 year period expected for the source to be observed like that. So this is a, a particular a random uh, location in the night sky. And here I'm uh, mentioning the number of visits that it will eventually have in all the six channels of NSSD. So what do we do with this? So we use this information and then we fold into our program, which allows us to determine this light uh, time delays uh, across redshifts and uh, uh, taking into account different cases of luminosities. So here in this work, which was uh, accepted a few months ago in uh, astrophysics, uh, astronomy and astrophysics, we did predictions for the LSST accounting for multiple survey strategies that were presented by the data management. So the survey strategy, the final survey strategy is yet to be confirmed. So it was a part of a task for the community involved in the consortium to uh, mention to the uh, data management group what sort of uh, uh, survey strategy really works best for their science cases. So here we accounted for multiple survey strategies uh, for the main survey, which is a much more uh, dedicated survey of the entire night sky and certain deep drilling fields, which are very well located uh, fields, which were already mapped in multiple wavelengths. And what we find indeed is that as a function of uh, time, so here on the left side is the 10 year campaign. And here I'm showing the uh, delay, the lags uh, versus the redshift. So basic, and this, the black line over here is the standard radius luminosity expected for this light. Those green points are the results from our simulations with characteristic error bars at a given redshift. So as you can see, when we have a source, which we could categorize as faint, uh, having the luminosity at 3000 angstroms, at 10 to the power 44.7 Earths per second, we have a distribution where we figure out that at higher redshifts, we will be able to reach the consensus with the standard accretion, this uh, standard radius luminosity deviation. But we do fault in the low redshift regime. And what's interesting is that because of the placement of the filters as they are, we would have some gaps in the data because sometimes the emission line would be missed in parts where there's an overlap in the filters. So there are certain redshifts that could definitely be avoided, which will allow us to focus on the redshift range, which really can give us appropriate results. Now, this is the result done for the 10 year campaign uh, survey. So when we take the case for the brighter luminosity, we see that we, the recovery is much better across redshift. So eventually the intention is we should focus. If there is an intention to select sources, brighter targets should be selected, which would help us recover back uh, the relation for these observed uh, targets. On the other hand, if you're just going to uh, isolate the two year period, uh, we took that for example. We also tried for a one-year campaign. The results for the bright are not very good. They are getting saturated, which really tells us that we indeed need longer coverage monitoring for such sources if we really want to revert back to the standard relation. So uh, this is a diagram uh, telling uh, the color matrix is basically telling us different survey strategies as a function of redshift. And over here around any uh, where basically it, the ratio is telling us what is the expected time delay as a function uh, with respect to the observed time delay. So we expect this to be uh, close to one unity. And as you can see in the faint cases, it's not really one. And we only arrive close to the expected relation, uh, expected radius luminosity value uh, when we go to brighter and brighter targets. So this was already uh, presented and then we're working to test our uh, code actually because it's a dual purpose deliverable software as part of our in-kind contribution portfolio. And this code allows us to do the simulation and provide uh, uh, conclusions about uh, the survey strategies that have been proposed. But when the real data comes in, we'll be able to use this to predict and estimate the uh, time lags for the sources that those are real. So very quickly, the another aspect of uh, uh, the reverberation mapping also includes the accretion discontinuum measurement of accretion discontinuum lags uh, and their modeling and predictions. So in this case, what one expects is that we have the central corona, uh, hot corona sitting over here, uh, and eventually it will produce uh, emission as well, which gets reflected from the accretion disk. And based uh, because the accretion disk closer to it will be much hotter, the emission is much hotter, and as we go radially outwards, things start to become more colder. 
And this is one uh, uh, sort of illustration showing how the delay function would change depending upon where it's been intercepted and at what direction as the observer is seeing them. So with this one re really, uh, is they also able to uh, measure the sizes of accretion disk and people have been doing that over many years. And this is uh, one uh, example showing the problems that we have in these kind of measurements. So here on the X axis, we have the lags, the, the time lags that is allowing us based on different wavelengths. So this dot, the dashed line here is what one should expect from the standard disk prediction. But what we really have is a much more steeper uh, uh, slope for the observed rotation. So there is a issue here, which is the accretion disk size problem. And the predicted time lags are of, of a factor two to three times the time lags of the standard disk. So people are right now very much focused about what really causes this kind of uh, deviation and are there any approaches that could allow us to uh, bring it back or cancel all these contamination which may be present. Uh, and this is something that has been uh, carried out more recently, also through uh, the much more uh, extended LSST consortium. So this was a work led by uh, Angelka Kovacevic from the Serbian group, uh, where me and Bujana were part of this work, where the idea was we would really account for the accretion disk transfer function, convolve it with the Dantran uh, uh light curve, which is the, the primary light curve uh, pro coming from the accretion disk, if it's thought to be, and then try to estimate the time lags the same way we have done for the DLRs. Uh, and this was focused on specifically the five uh, deep drilling fields, the ones that I mentioned are much more focused where there is plenty of multi-wavelength data already available. Uh, so in the idea was that indeed that is deviation from standard disk scenario and problems could be because of some contamination or the observing uh, strategy needs to be deferred back to have much more uh, frequent observations. So the cadence basically needs to be much more quicker of the order of a day, two days uh, observation, which would allow us to distinguish how these contamination really impact the recovered time lags. So this was something led by uh, Vikram Jaswal, who's sitting here, a PhD student of Ushena right now, who uh, also studied this uh, aspect of how the presence of the BLR really is a impact is a has a major impact on the scattering of the emission that is coming from the accretion disk. So what happens really is that it's hard that all of the accretion disk emission directly comes to our line of sight. Most part of it could also be reflect scattered by the presence of the BLR, and the information of the BLR is then embedded in this. So when we are computing the time lags for the accretion disk, we are actually computing something which is not entirely just the accretion disk, but combined together with the presence of these clouds. So it creates this additional contamination, which is what we want to study and uh, really be able to uh, eradicate if you really want to estimate the real accretion this time lags here. Uh, this was motivated by one of the recent work by Adai Netzer, where he presented this uh, um, uh, theoretical model where he, he found that indeed at certain wavelengths, there is a prominence of uh, the scattered emission, which is the diffuse continuum emission. And here one sees that this is what, what is called as the Balmer jump here. Over here is the passion jump. And there are the emission lines as well presented. So indeed, there are certain wavelengths where the emission is comprised not only of the continuum, but mostly dominated by the scattered part, which is responsible basically from the BLR. So we, we were doing a lot of tests around this and Ashwini Pandey, who is a postdoc here with Bushana, uh, has recently submitted a paper on this, how the impact of these uh, on the scattered emission, as well as the presence of dust impacts uh, the overall uh, problem here that is related to contamination. Another very interesting work that we did with Francesco Pozo Nunez, led by him, is that we wanted to do accretion disk prediction, accounting for an ad hoc BLR contribution and doing a much more refined way of the time sampling. So this is all again very simulation-based numerical pro projects where this time we don't really only uh, include the accretion disk emission, but we also in included this diffuse continuum emission that I showed that is basically coming from the scattering uh, from the BLR. By accounting this and holding it together, we are getting a total uh, uh, spectrum of the source, uh, simulated spectrum of the source, and then we study how this is impacted as a function of wavelength. So indeed, one is able to recover of sorts 
the observed time lag. So here the black points are observed time lags, and each of these dotted lines are simulation simulated uh, lag versus uh, wavelength results. So when we do in, uh, include the DCE, one really is able to find out a sort of agreement between this offset uh, that is happening at certain wavelengths. So the eventual result, if I want to summarize this, is that one really needs increased time uh, sampling of the order of two to five days and reduce BLR and emission line contamination, which is meaning that we need to focus on paths of the wavelengths where the emission line is not as strong. And that will help improve the time delay accuracy in the case of operation risk. So this is a, a very complementary result, but it's quite interesting. Uh, we recently published this in Astrophysical Journal Letters, where this is the first observation of a double peaked oxygen one emission line uh, from a very high throughput uh, Gemini spectrum for a source 332. Uh, what's quite interesting, this kind of phenomena really helps identify and provides a unique way to estimate the sizes of the accretion disk, uh, the outer edge of the accretion disk rather, and the inclination when we are able to model the source using this modeling profile. So what we have done over here in this work is that we've identified multiple emission lines which clearly show these double P or double horn structures. And we have modeled them using uh, the disk uh, model. Uh, and we were able to identify what is the size, outer size of the accretion disk, the inclination angle with respect to uh, the distant observer, and eventually the black hole mass. So one problem using the estimation of from reverberation mapping is that, OK, we have the spectroscopic information, so we have widths. Reverberation allows us to measure the sizes. And we can use the virial relation then to estimate the masses. But there is this fudge factor, F factor, which accounts for the geometry and the information of inclination, which is not usually provided if the sources are not radio loud. Because in the sources which are radio loud, you could use the radio jet as an indicator of how much they are inclined to the distant observer. Sources which are intermediate or radio quiet or radio silent eventually don't show these uh, uh, features uh, of radio emission. So this is an, another direct, indirect way to estimate the inclination because we are able to see the emission from the two edges of the equation disk here. So the blue part refers to the bump that we've seen in the blue side, and the red part is much more further out, which is from coming from the accretion disk, which is on the other side from the observer. And these eventually, con the convolution of these Gaussians really allows us to figure out this double peak structure, which is very well prominent in multiple emission lines that we are seeing here. So this allowed uh, uh, independent uh, method to really move towards the near infrared regime, which is where the JWST is going to be focusing on. It's already doing this. Sorry, uh, I would like to understand very well the physical origin of this double yes. maximum profile. So I understand that on the receding edge, you see standard shifted radiation. On the edge, which is actually approaching us, you see the bush at one. But on top of that, we mm -hmm. also have the ones which are sort of in the middle. In and we don't see any edge. Yes. This seems to be sort of much weaker than, than the outer ones. What's the reason for that? So um, this could be really related. If the accretion disk was continuous until the black hole, let's say, then we would have seen a much more prominent multiple Gaussian where the valley would not be as prominent because there is a phase change really very close to the black hole. So we change the phase uh, by flip by 90 degrees. And this is what we see in the direct light in sense. So if we were going to see this in polarized light, we will see a negative peak and then there will be a jump at zero, and then it will have this reflected model here. So, it so this is a, a artistic illustration. This is a real spectra over here. So here we can really see that there is a presence of this double peak structure. But in order to really fit the profile, which also accounts for emission coming from uh, the broadline region over here, so there is a need to add an extra Gaussian. And this central peak that we are seeing is coming from a much narrower, uh, much further out narrower region. So the sum total profile is a con convoluted one, but clearly what we can see is that the, the presence of double peak is uh, is uh, without a doubt present in these emission lines. Mm -hmm. So this the peak is almost like the rings, right? To some extent. Why are the the then it really sharp, something like that, and if the GIA or uh, even special relativity yeah. collections are quadratic, then it's not important. 
the the both things should be at the same time. So if you this include the central part, basically eats out the yes, the that eats out this part. Yes. So in in if it was just accretion disk, we would not even see this kind of peaks that we see, but we simply, as Pushana said, just two peaks. Uh, which was well separated, telling us about the extension of the outer part of the efficient disk. Mm -hmm. And just the idea yeah, that the temperature, temperature if the black hole spin affects it uh, somehow, or it is just too far away from the black hole. So uh, that's a very good question, and this is something that will impact the inner radius rather, uh, and because it's much closer, yeah. the effect would be much stronger. Here, when we accounted, for, we did account for GR effects, but we do not see any major difference. It will be within the error bars. Of the size of that we estimate, so they were not really counting uh, for. It would major probably effect. involve some asymmetry. Yes. So this the interesting thing. So this was a spectra taken in 2021, and we continued observing this source over the last two years, and we do see that the peaks are breathing in some sense. So the intention was, can we do something more about this? And this is I'm going to show here. So we collected the archival light curve for this source over the last 10 years. Uh, I mean, actually much longer. So it started in 2005, so there was this Catalina real-time survey that was observing this target. Uh, it stopped eventually, and then there was Palomar Transient Factory. SDSS observed this for a couple of years because they were doing intensive reverberation on this source. Uh, and then much later, there was the ZTF, so it started on 2018 and still continuously observing. And this is where we got the spectra. So the problem was we didn't have a photometry to compare whether this fluctuation is happening because of something intrinsic to the continuum. And this is why we wanted to address the continuum part of uh, the emission through photometry. Uh, just as a digression, small digression here, uh, we were able to figure, uh, find uh, in the lit literature uh, the radio light curve of this and compare with our optical light curve that we just presented here. And we found that there is a synchronous behavior both in the radio. So whenever there was a radio flare, we also saw in this pretty much in the similar period a flare in the optical. Uh, and then there were a few that the last one was unaccounted for, uh, which they did find in the radio. So there were some interesting features that this source does modulate, but unfortunately there was no infrared spectrum at this point. There was just photometry. So what we try to do is uh, as a part of this new collaboration, the S plus collaboration, uh, the idea is that we would like to uh, have the photometric observation of the entire southern part of the, uh, the hemisphere. And uh, so this is the Southern Photometric Local Universe Survey. The most interesting part about it is, is that in addition to the six broadband filters of SDSS, it has six narrowband filters, which are, uh, I hope you can see, there are certain narrowbands which are located uniquely placed for the local sources like the Balmer jump or oxygen to calcium, H and K line, H delta, G band, the magnesium triplet, H alpha, and calcium triplet in the near infrared. So thanks to this, we, we are now doing this monitoring over the last couple of years, and I wanted to show you some recent results. So what happened with the ZTF is was going in a sort of a spiraling down phase. So the flux was kind of receding. And these are results from the late part of 2022. Uh, in both R and G band, and we can, I mean, the cadence was not very high, the observations were halted due to uh, technical issues, but which we can see that there is an inherent behavior of increasing in the photometry. Uh, to complement this, we have taken uh, five other spectra using uh, Gemini and SOAR and IRTF. Uh, so, um, uh, Denimara, who's also attending this meeting, so she's a PhD student uh, who's uh, I'm co-supervising, and she's currently working on this, so we would be able to say more about how the changes in the light curves really affects the symmetry and uh, the double peak profile in this very interesting source. Uh, so very quickly, now I go to the second part of the talk, which is about the narrow line region. Uh, and one interesting part of the narrow line region that we are focusing on is something the emission of the coronal lines. Uh, coronal lines are forbidden high ionization emission lines, typically of ionization potential greater than 100 eV. And they, these are reliable signatures considered to be the presence of AGNs in galaxies. So by studying them, this is really useful for us because they tell us that there are emitting regions that can be photoionized by the central continuum, which can extend up to kiloparsecs. So here are two examples. This is one by, uh, done by my supervisor and one of his other PhD students. Uh, Circinus A, where this is a map of iron 7 forbidden line uh, at 6087 angstrom. 
and the extended region goes up to seven kiloparsecs. So this is a very interesting source where people are now starting to find the impact of the aging continuum on the emitting region at such large distances. This is another example, IC5563. This has slightly lower impact. Uh, it extends up to 0.3 kiloparsecs in the radial range here. And if you look at the spectra of one of these sources, we can see multiple narrow features, which are all corresponding to forbidden emission lines. Most of them aren't here in red. So this is quite interesting because there's a plethora of lines that can be used, modeled, and understood through observations in order to see the impact of HGN or non-thermal emissions, such as the radio and shock-motivated emission lines. Uh, here's just some examples of uh, spectra that have collected over the time. And uh, this is part of the optic uh, campaign that we wanted to study whether we could use coronal lines for some direct indicators of the AGN and its uh, black hole properties. So this are, these are certain spectra that were collected from a uh, uh, telescope site in Classleu in Argentina and in Soar Goodman. And here I'm showing some more in a near infrared regime using the 8 meter Gemini NR and 4.1 uh, black hole SOAR R coins. So here we are highlighting all of these very interesting you know, coronal line regions. And the, these over here are for the silicon six that I'm going to show you in a bit. What is very interesting because when we kind of take the uh, flux of silicon six and connect it with the black hole masses, a very interesting trend appears over here. So here's a plot of about 31 AGNs which have already been reverberation mapped. So we have the estimates of black hole masses for this source. Now we complement this with this near infrared uh, observations where we have silicon six. And when we do this uh, ratio of silicon six over the nearest uh, um, uh, line, uh, hydrogen line, the bracket gamma, we see a very neat correlation that arises here. It has a dispersion of 0.29, very comparable to the M sigma relationship, which is well known over uh, the last two, uh, three de decades. Uh, what, and the question then arises, why do these lines have any connection with the black hole masses? As I said, if they are indicators of accretion rate and strong uh, AGN continuum, but we wanted to study this further. Uh, so what we have also done is that we have generated multiple SEDs accounting for spin and a few different ranges of masses and accretion rate and coupled it together uh, into radiative transfer modeling to see if we can recreate the diagram through photoionization simulations. So what the photoionization simulation suggests us that for the entire range of black hole mass from 10 to the power 5 up to 10 to the power 10, 9, which is what is the range of observed sources here, and accounting for slightly higher spin parameters, we can find a Vespel local density of 10 to the power 4 to 10 to the power 5 per cc, located at about 3 parsecs for these sources, which, which is a problem. And the problem is around 3 parsecs, this is where the telescope resolution stops. So, as I showed you in the previous diagram, when we are talking about kiloparsec, these are uh, spatially resolved. But three parsecs are still too uh, close to the black hole, and our instrument's resolutions are not good enough. Not even JWST will end up being able to find three parsecs. For that, we need to go to interferometry like gravity if we want to uh, measure the size of this. So this is an uh, ongoing work that we would like to select targets, a uh, few targets, and uh, try VLTI on these sources to really confirm the size of this. But what's interesting is that the models are able to confirm the envelope of uh, data points uh, that is seen from the observation. And this is one example of a very recent JWST spectra. Mm -hmm that came, uh, um, came out uh, this year, last year. Uh, and the interesting thing about the near spec of JWST, it, uh, come, it goes from 2.5 micron to 25 micron. So we get in a single snapshot a very broadband SED. And in a case like this, we also see plethora of coronal line emissions. So the goal of our project is just extended towards JWST with this new upcoming data, where we would like to characterize all these emitting regions which produce these coronal lines. So finally, very quickly, I would like to summarize uh, and come back to that problem that I mentioned to you uh, a few minutes before, which was these sources which were deviating from the classical radius luminosity relationship were indeed found to be the ones with higher Eddington ratios. And in the more recent works led by Yuan Wang and later by me, we have figured up, we found that indeed the iron emission strength that I showed you before, the RFE parameter of the quasar main sequence, 
is intrinsically related to the Eddington ratio parameter. So what's interesting, if we do have a spectra and we do measure the iron 2 strength in these sources, we can have an observational parameter that can help quantify the dispersion and deviation from the standard deviation. So if we do account for this, then we end up having a relation which is slightly modified from the much simpler radius versus luminosity. Now we have radius versus luminosity with an additional uh, dependence on the RMB, but the relation is much more constrained. So those sources that I'm highlighting in stars are the ones that were deviating the most here. So they in, indeed, with some scatter, come back to this uh, almost classical relation. So why are we interested in making such a relation much more standardized? The whole idea is that through reverberation mapping, and separately through single epoch spectroscopy, we independently derive the luminosities and pluses from two different techniques. Combining them, we get the luminosity distance. So this is not very model method dependent because indeed those two parameters are coming from two different observations. Once we couple them together, we have the luminosity distances and eventually we can create uh, the Hubble diagram for quasars and then uh, confront against uh, the uh, standard cosmological models, whether this is applicable in this very neat uh, redshift space where possibly only quasars can fill up this gap. So in the local universe, we do have CEPIs, supernovae, uh, and the tip of the red giant branch, but eventually we come to a point where there is sort of missing information, which is where the quasars are well suited to uh, fill up this gap. And eventually using radius luminosity relationship or uh, the luminosity of X-ray versus UV luminosity uh, relationship, we could uh, figure out whether quasars can indeed help uh, to uh, confront the cosmological models that are available to us. So uh, we have plenty of data and upcoming data is just getting huge. Uh, we'll have uh, tons of uh, ground-based and space-based telescopes that are already operating or some are going to be operational. And all these exciting sciences are going to be much more interesting to study with large number of statistics. And here I would uh, leave you with my summary. And thank you so much for your attention. We are on time. I was already thinking okay, <laughs> only on the second point, but okay. now the final was really very quick concise, and yes, okay. concise. So thank you. It was excellent talk. Thank you so much. And the question, please. I encourage students to ask questions and post on things. And maybe also people on Zoom. Please uh, turn on your mic and ask. So my first question may be just uh, for curiosity. What is still the uh, thing which is responsible for the scatter of this relation? You are having now much more tight correlation, but there is this scatter. So what are the physical reasons? So uh, one very complicated reason is that the iron emission in the optical is spanned between a wide wavelength range about 4,434 to 4,684 angstrom, and it contains over 1,500 transitions. Uh, if we had resolution high enough, we could identify each of these individual transitions. But the thing is, with observations and noise, this all gets blended together and it forms a pseudo continuum over, overall. And the estimation of RFE or the parameter RFE is a tricky thing. It requires a lot of good data and really high signal to noise data in order to identify the peaks. So it can be done only for very high features where the independent transitions stand out. But most of these sources, which are reverberation map, are in the low Eddington ratio category where the FE2 emission is not as strong. So these kind of lie in the local relation, so they don't deviate much. Uh, and as you can see, some of these sources do have high error bars, and this is related to also the problems of how the cadence and how we are monitoring using the validation mapping, how we are estimating the time lags, the errors issued in the time lags, and this corrections of RFP additionally adds to the scatter. But uh, we are trying to implement something in, uh, a proxy of RFE, which is the calcium triplet emission. It's a three independent line emission, uh, and it really shows up very prominently in high craters. So instead of uh, working with 1500 transition, we just work with three transition, which is a very good proxy of uh, iron. But right now, there's not much near infrared data with reverberation available. So we have about 15 sources right now. 
we are just building up this in the next few years, we will have something comparable to what we have in the optical, which is about 200 sources uh, here. So that's something. Yes, yeah, some dispersion will be always certainly due to the viewing angle, which yes. you mentioned. Yes, yes. yes. Again, hard to reduce, but that's not that big because the tallus cuts the two highest, two high yeah, up to viewing angle. Yes. But still, it's, it's something there. And then maybe traces of the of the uh, dependence of the of the three D structure of the broad vision on, on the black hole mass which sort mm -hmm. of disappears. disappears here, yes. And then systematic effects like the evolutionary status of this AGMs is not the same. That that should not matter because it's quite surprising but uh, uh, metallicity of AGMs is always more or less solar or slightly super solar. It's not like with stars. If you go to uh, higher distances, higher redshifts, you have the population two stars, something like that, low metallicity. There is nothing like uh, low metallicity quasar. Mm -hmm. We still have those so prominent lines at very high redshifts. They are obviously born right after the star burst phase. And this kind of standardized them for the metallicity apparent. Quite interesting question, but it's not our responsibility. <laughs> okay. yeah. Just for curiosity. Well, I, I have one question. Yes. So in that uh, radius must be covered where the sources with high return is zero radiate from that. Yes. So typically um no, let no. me go back to the no. previous slide. Yeah. So typically those sources which were the one more deviating. So I counted those ones which were having accretion rate higher than the uh, editor limit. So these are marked in the stars, as you can see. So there are not many super Eddington sources, but those were the ones, as you can see, were here and they got shifted very close to the relation itself. So the, the point is that the RFE in these is able to give a correction because of its connection with Eddington ratio. So uh, that answers the question. But, um, okay. But I'm just trying to understand how this uh, Eddington ratio or the FP2 strength is affecting the results. So the Eddington ratio, as I showed you in the previous first part of the slide, accretion rate has a very important implication on the evolution of the structural disc, disc evolution. So when one accounts for a very high accretor, and we saw it from our photonization modeling, is that the BLR sizes do shrink. And the shrinking could be a result of the change in the accretion disk itself, the additional anisotropy. So there is a puffiness. I mean, this is yet to be convinced. I am, these are some few first few works that are suggesting this, but this would end up shielding part of the low ionization part of the BLR, which is prominently producing HB emission, and this kind of slowly con comes very closer. And this is agreeing with the results of the reverberation mapping. So those sources which do deviate shows shorter lags are the ones where this accretion rate dependence is also seen. Uh, one of the past postdoc of Prashana, uh, Mari Lolly, she worked on this. And the problem there was the accretion rate was the indicator. But since accretion rate is dependent on luminosity and the black hole mass, it was a circular problem. So we wanted to find out and basically do and Wang have actually produced this plot for the first time where this is an observational quantity independent of luminosity and mass. And this is how it really relates to suggesting that accretion rate depends on the RFE, which is able to uh, sort of shift those sources back into this modified radius luminosity relationship. At least it works. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I just noticed there is some chat message. Can oh. you check if this is a question or? This is not a question. It's no, just no. A thanks. And ah, okay. This is just thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Anyway, so thanks, thanks a lot for your presence, for your great seminar.